Molo Sanbonani, hello, how's it? Shalom, khuyenant. Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Liberty and Friends here on the Big Daddy Liberty Show. My name is Sihle Gobese, a.k.a. Big Daddy Liberty. Welcome to it as um, we seek to start the show. Uh, the show, of course, being on a Monday night, I know it's a bit of a random one. We uh, <laughs> had a bit of an issue uh, going live last night, and uh, I did ask for your indulgence for us to do the show tonight, but nothing changes whether we do it on a Sunday evening or a Monday. Remember, your only price of admission here on Liberty and Friends or the BDL show is to hit that like button. Come on, do it now. Whether you're watching this simulcast on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube, do me a big solid and hit that like button. And if you're on YouTube, hit that bell notification so that you also get notified every time we post. Welcome to it. It is a Monday evening. Uh, an unusual one for Liberty and Friends, but we are here. And as usual, we have a veritable who's who of Friends, the panel tonight, who will help us unpack the news week that was last week. Big, big headlines last week, which we can chew on on what will be the next 90 minutes of the show. Remember, Liberty and Friends is the one long format show that I have. In fact, one more thing I need to ask for. Uh, before I get to my guests, because it is happening on a Monday evening, many people might not know we're on. Do me a favor, also share this link. Let your friends know that Liberty and Friends is on. Good evening, welcome to it. My first guest, of course, is a fella who you haven't seen in a while. Last time you saw him was last year. In fact, it was an episode where we went out to um, one of his favorite haunts in Somerset West, a particular gun shop in that part of the world. He is a big advocate for your gun rights and really your ability to defend yourself. He is also instrumental, a communications expert for various organizations that I know you guys love. I'm talking, of course, about Upra Tim, Flack, there he is on screen. Tim, good evening. Hey, how's it, Tito? How are you? Hey, Tada, my brother. Good to see you. Very good to have you on the show again on this a wonderful new year. Another familiar face, perhaps one who you haven't seen in a while, but I know you guys, he is a favorite, firm favorite rather, for you guys. He is the deputy editor out at the Daily Friend. Remember, Daily Friend, your new source of opinion and analysis every single day at www.dailyfriend.co.za. There he is, Umarius Ruet. Marius, good evening. How's it, Claire? How's it, Tim? Hey, ta-da, hey, ta-da, hey, ta-da. Of course, Upra, oh, sorry, Tim, I wanted to say either, but I'm being very rude. <laughs> Okay, Tim, you're muted, but uh, let me move on. There we go, there we go. Um, let me move on, though, to a very firm, familiar, and favorite here on the BDL show. This chap is, I've always introduced him as really one of the few people I know who literally has a strong command of nearly any topic that you want to discuss. Again, why? Because he's very well read and one of the smarter individuals I know. Remember, I always said, you, you want to be in a room where you're the dumbest oak in that room, so you can learn from homies. And this is one of those homies who I definitely learn from. Oh, Gabriel Kraus, our host of Two Crickets in a Thorn Tree. Putwami, good evening, welcome. Dude, keeping it hot on a Monday. I feel the, I feel the weekend uh, strength of energy on a Monday coming from you, Sitle, and I enjoy that. Thank you for hey, the very delightful yeah. introduction. <laughs> Hey, tonight, dude, good to very good to have you, Rabba. Excuse, excuse me on the show. Um, last but definitely not least, a new face, new face, new face, new face. Haven't done that dance in a while. Of course, he is a um, one of the economics gurus out at the trade union Solidarität. Elevetek is buyer leaf for the back, but Solidarité doing um, as they represent workers, of course in this country, and of course, fight for many other civil society issues. There he is, Utiens Du Boisson. Did I say that right, Tiens? Yeah, Du Boisson. Du Boisson, there we go. Very but French. I'm um, getting your name wrong as well, so. Yeah. Quality, but... 
No worries, homie. Good to have you on the show. A brand new face. We always, always appreciate those here on the BDL show. Speaking about new faces, I'm going to begin with you, Tiens, because really the first issue is one which really touches on that labor issue. I know a lot of people were hoping would begin on the Joe Rogan point, but um, we'll, we'll cover that in a short while. Bear with us, uh, dear viewer. But I really wanted to begin where uh, with something that literally touched our lives as South Africans for the past, uh, was it the past five days or so? That is load shedding and really... The, the shambolic and almost uh, zombie-like at this point organization called ESCOM that sort of trudges along, um, you know, turns load shedding an ongoing problem, but I want to link it. Clearly at this point also, there's a conversation to be had about the brain drain that ESCOM is experiencing. A lot of people saying working there is a toxic environment. Yeah, no, seriously, for sure. Um, and I mean, how do you wreck a monopoly? Surely that's not a simple thing to do. But, well, ESCO managed to do it and continues to wreck it even further every day. Because, um, you know, it's just disgraceful. Um, the staff losses that they've had lately and um, not being able to come to a, um, a, any agreement in terms of last year's um, salary increase increases in terms of services and all that and while this massive brain drain is going on just refusing to actually come to the table last year i um, wrote a report um as part of this um negotiation process advising that the last thing they can afford now on top of all their financial struggles is to also have um employee flight on their list of problems and well they didn't listen but also, they've been having that problem for a very long time now, so it's nothing new. And clearly, like the rest of the South African state and its institutions, they just don't care. Like, and it comes down to, um, at this point, um, people actually sometimes even saying off the record that they're glad about some of this employee flight, because luckily most of the people fleeing are white. So... People would literally sit in the dark rather than see white people in positions of good employment. And this is what really gets to me, uh, Gabriel, as I come to you, because, you know, I, I, I referenced this conversation off of an, an article that was in the papers last week. Uh, it was also in, pardon me, not in the papers, but rather on, uh, is it Business Tech? Um, which is an online publication. And one of the issues which really frightened me, because Tiens is, is, is pointing at one factor which is absolutely critical. It's, it's the ongoing um, implementations of policies such as affirmative action and BE at the expense of other groupings. That is, you know, policies which by their very nature, I suppose, lend themselves to doing that. But also there's a bigger conversation here insofar as how a confluence of issues, including this one, has even led to some people leaving that organization without even the prospect of another job. People find working there so toxic that they're actually even willing to resign and leave even if they don't have another job. Guys, there's something wrong in our SOEs and ESCOM. Yeah, and it's a long time coming. I do. I remember one of the stranger ESCOM conversations that I had was in the town of Schweizer Reinecke, uh, which is, I don't know, a dust bowl in the northwest. Apologies to all residents of Schweizer Reinecke watching this. Um, <laughs> and I was there to cover a race based incident. You know, you know, anyway, it was a long story. But I was there for a few days. And on one of them, I encountered a f some youth, people in their early 20s. Uh, hanging out next to a school uh, it, with the boot of the car open, playing some music, and they were having a drink or two. Um, and they invited me over. They said, hey, dude, why don't you come over, have a drink, let's have a chat. And so I did, and I asked them what they did. And the only one of them who had a job was working at ESCOM. And he was he was a colored dude, and he had golden Nike ticks uh, sort of drilled into his teeth, and he was very stylish and very charismatic. And... And I said, what's it like working at ESCOM? And he said, it's too sleepy. Oh. He said he was desperately, he was busy making his own business because he said two things were going to happen to him. 
either he was going to get fired from ESCOM, not fired, but retrenched because the whole thing was going to collapse because it's so useless that South Africans would realize that there must be a better way. Uh, and he said, if that's going to happen, he wants to already have a, a life raft to jump into if this whole ship really sinks. And then he said the other option is that he doesn't get fired and no one gets retrenched, but no one's really doing their job. And he's going to learn to not do his job. He's going to learn to wake up in the morning and think, I'm going to show up for a salary instead oh. of thinking, I'm going to show up to do something. And it was amazing because to look at this guy from the outside through the lens of like stereotypes uh, that, that South African media love to, to, to play in, you know, like uh, evil white farmers and purely innocent black victims. This was the sort of reason that I was drawn into Schweizer Reinecke was like a headline story that was just going around that was not judging individuals. It was just looking at pigments like that. Then like colored dude dressed like a gangster. Um, you would just get a completely different sense to if you talk to the individual. And I kept his number and I phoned him a year later and I was like, what are you doing? He's like, dude, I left ESCOM. It's the greatest move I ever made. He had his own business uh retailing some tech and and you know providing sort of laying pools for people in in Mahikeng. um and he said it was very exciting so i thought there's one problem with escom is that if oh. you do get a talented energetic excited young individual even who does tick the right boxes for your for your bloody social identity uh, engineering game that's not going to help because your whole culture your business, your business modus operandi is not oriented to delivering services. It's not oriented to solving hard problems and making difficult decisions. It's oriented towards passing the buck and holding on to a few extra bucks if you can. Um, so I think that's an unfortunate hole they've dug themselves into. And I'll say one other thing, which is less anecdotal, it's more macro. Uh, it's that, you know, Jabba Mabuza, chairman of, of the ESCOM board for several years in about 2018, drew attention to the fact that between about 2008 and 2018, the ESCOM staff had, oh, correct me if I'm wrong, doubled, tripled. I mean, it had grown an enormous amount. And the ESCOM power capacity, actual production, actual usable capacity had flatlined. So it's like per staff member, ESCOM had just become three times, half, twice or three times less efficient. And Jabba yeah. Mabuza said, clearly we are overstaffed. There is no metric according to which we're not overstaffed. We've got to get rid of some of the, the excess staff, people who are here with sinecures uh, rather than actual value-add jobs. Here was the warning that uh, Dr. Franz Krenier, then CEO of the IRR, gave. He said, if you're not very careful, if you do it very well, you're going to go in office by office, department by department. You're going to see who are the people who've been cutting corners and you're going to get rid of them. You're going to see who are the people who are under-motivated. You're going to try and motivate them. But that's going to take effort. And that's not what ESCOM is all about at the moment. So instead, the other option is to offer people uh, slightly preferable uh, retrenchment packages uh, or sign-off deals. And the people who are going to take it are the people who can make it outside of ESCOM. And the people who are going to hide under their desk and stick around as much as they can are the people who need ESCOM because the only place they can survive is in, uh, is in an environment that doesn't require them to add value. Yeah, and I think that's really somewhat what Theance is speaking to, this, 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 this confusion where it's a dilemma. It's like you've got too much stuff. Surely we've got to get rid of some stuff. But then you're getting rid of stuff in a way that makes it even worse. Ah. <laughs> yeah, the crazy thing is that now it's um, competent people who do have other prospects are the ones leaving. Where, um, like in some fields of engineering, um, ESCOM is actually um, needing to outsource um, that work because they have too few employees. But in administrative positions, management positions, where um, people tend to get paid more as well, um, they're overstaffed, so I'd agree. But when it comes to the people actually doing the work, they're constantly struggling with staff shortages, which is also, I guess, typical of any captured institution lately. If you I can just say... Their bodies in where they get paid a lot and not have to do much. It's the... See, the paradox is like being skinny fat. When you... When you yeah. so... You, you, you skinny, skinny, skinny inside. There's no muscles. You can't even walk. <laughs> but like from the outside, you look like a roly-poly. I think that's Esco. <laughs> Absolutely apt, apt uh, description there. 
And, you know, Morris, even as I bring it to you, um, I'll come to you just now in a moment, Tim. You know, I, I just shared a, a, an image uh, here on screen by Annie Escom, uh, is just announced that at 9 p.m. tonight, uh, her chatting is back after having said, hey, man, give us a week. We'll sort it out by Monday. It's gone. Um, and, and now it's back. But we've now reached a stage as South Africans where we actually we've normalized the decline of society. It doesn't even shock or elicit anger anymore that a parastatal, a single provider of electricity in this country says this. No one even bats an eyelid anymore. We just sort of trudge along. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly it. And I think we've done that in a lot of things in South Africa. We've accepted this kind of decline. I mean, just around the area where I live, uh, the number of potholes, I mean, it's absolutely shocking. And I mean, just even five years ago, you wouldn't have seen seen it. And But I think ESCOM is a microcosm of uh, South African society in general, uh, you know, where there's this kind of uh, obsession with transformation. And transformation is actually not about replacing white people with black people. Transformation should be about providing opportunities to people who were deprived them in the past. And we all know the history of a country that's primarily black people and so on. But we've seen what's happened in ESCOM, what, uh, as Terence was saying now, what employees have been chased away. There's people who would rather sit in the dark than know that there are uh, skilled white engineers and so on working at ESCOM. And I think that is just, as I said, it's, it's a microcosm of South Africa where instead of, you know, keeping the skills, these skills might be the wrong color and they get chased away. And that is actually, it's to the detriment of everybody in South Africa, white, black, you know, Indian colored, whatever the case might be. And, you know, this is a bit of a trite statement, but I think it's from uh, Deng Xiaoping, former uh, Premier of China. I mean, I don't normally like, uh, you know, quoting uh, leaders of Red China, but uh, he said he doesn't care what color the uh, cat is that's uh, in his silo. Uh, you know, if it's catching mice, he doesn't care if it's black or white. And I think that should be what we should be thinking about in South Africa. And, you know, uh, it's also an another trite statement, but, you know, a policy, a policy shouldn't be looked at its intent. It should be looked at what is the outcome of that policy. And I think we've seen that exactly. with a lot of things like black economic empowerment and employment equity. We can, I think we can all probably agree that they, they did come, they were thought out with, you know, uh, no noble intentions to make up for a lot of the wrongs of the past and all the terrible things that happened uh, under apartheid. So, I mean, we don't have to rehash, rehash all that yeah. But we've seen what's happened. We've seen how... Uh, there's been uh, distortions in the economy. We've seen how uh, the government's been of, uh, often um, fleeced for money. I mean, we've, we all know the stories where, you know, there'll be a company supplying water bottles to the government for conferences and a water bottle you can buy for 10 rand in the shop. They're selling it for 100 bucks to the government, whatever the case is. Mm. And I mean, that's just one, one issue. And it's because the government's been, has kind of been uh, this uh, engine for uh, economic growth, especially to grow the South African black middle class. But we know that's not sustainable. What you need is an economy that grows sustainably every year at five or six percent. And unfortunately, with the way with our government is running things, it's it's a complete impossibility to even get. We, I mean, if you look back at the, I think the last time we had three percent growth was about seven or eight years ago. And three percent mm -hmm. is not really enough for what we need in South Africa. We need at least five or six percent if we want to really start making a dent in unemployment and uh, poverty. Absolutely. And that's the, the, the sad part. It's, it, it, what makes it tragic is that it's not like South Africa doesn't know this or rather hasn't experienced this. Or let me be specific, pardon me. It's not like South Africa hasn't been on this path before um, where indeed commensurate to that, there was a buoyancy and optimism in this country for a very brief period of time. And those were under the Mbegi years, if I can uh, just bring everybody's memories back. We had almost three years of consecutive 5% uh, plus growth in this country that allowed even the ANC government to not only pay back all apartheid debt that the democratic dispensation had settled uh, had been saddled with, but beyond that, even allowed the ANC to then roll out, ironically enough, all of the social welfare programs. Um, you know, and again, I'm not prosecuting whether they were right or wrong to do that. I'm just stating a, a, a statement of fact, like the sky is blue. It allowed them to then roll out at a much, much more extensive um, uh, 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 extent, pardon me, 
all the social welfare programs and fund them out of the actual fiscus and not off of debt and borrowing. That was the key difference, which obviously we've now uh, regressed from. Tim, I want to come to you, but before I do, uh, um, I just want to remind everybody, guys, in the audience, you are a part of Liberty and Friends. Your comments will be flighted on the screen. I am keeping an eye on them here on the dashboard. Remember, guys, my engagement Hit that like button, please. As you enter, hit that like button. Uh, my engagement has to be over 50%. Whether you like the show or dislike it, either hit that like or dislike it like button, but get them likes up. Get them up, get them up, get them up. Tim, dude, I must come to you because, you know, everybody here has set out quite lucidly, you know, the issue with ESCOM, but it really doesn't end at ESCOM, doesn't it? You know, I've always held, you know, the states is pretty much useless at doing anything to be brutally honest and really shouldn't be out outside of a very few functions as a libertarian or a classical liberal i'd argue those functions are very limited We're usually just one defending us from foreign aggression i.e a presidency diplomatic corps a, a defense force um two domestic uh, protecting us protecting us pardon me from domestic threats a police force criminal justice uh, or pardon me uh, uh uh, penal uh, system, and of course, arbitrating our disputes. You know, in a country of nearly 60 million people, 11 different cultures, also, uh, pardon me, 11 languages, also the cultures, of course, we'll have disputes every now and then. Hence, we want a judiciary, uh, you know, eminent people in our peers who then arbitrate those disputes. Those are the three functions of government. Everything else the government tries usually turns out to trash. We see this, for example, in Denel and other SOEs. ESCOM is not alone. Mm. No, no, you, you, you're quite right in that, and, and uh, what we're seeing at, at ESCOM is, is things that we'll, we'll be seeing at institutions like Denel, um, where, where employees are have, have such a bad time at their workplace that they're willing to resign without even finding alternative employment. And that's just mm -hmm. an indicator of how bad the situation actually is, or how bad your boss is, or how bad you're being treated. Um, and it, it's typical of all government-run institutions. They, there's absolutely zero to bugger all succession planning uh, ever done by government. Uh, you see it mm -hmm. in SAPS, you see it in the SNDF, you see it in Denel. When um, when someone who is experienced in the job is, is, is ready to leave or has resigned and left, there's been no succession planning for someone to take over, someone in the organization to take over. So what happens, people get outsourced from the outside like we see in SAPS, and we see a total bugger up in, in the way the organizations run because these people don't know how the organizations are supposed to function in the first place. Absolutely. And I, again, even as you say this, uh, Morris, I'm going to throw it back to you and then uh, Tians, because there's something to be said. And obviously, I don't want to be accused, as often is the case on the show. Oh, we, we always talk about the problems we, we hear people say uh, in, in, as a criticism of my show. Well, let's look at some of the solutions then. What can we do here? Because, guys, we're literally sitting with an, a, a zombie organization, uh, sort of, you know, uh, sort of almost Frankensteinish, you know, brains, you know. <laughs> Uh, sort of trudging along in the dark, demanding brains, given the brain drain, oh, see what I did there, that they are experiencing. But um, something can and surely must be done with the SOEs. Marius, some of the top solutions you have in mind. How do we get South Africans back into an economy where actually there is a reliable source of electricity, which then feeds a booming economy? Well, I think with uh, things like something like ESCOM, uh, I think one of the solutions is to break it up into... Uh, I think three different uh, uh, new companies, generation, transmission, whatever the case is. And I think uh, also uh, one, one positive thing that's come out of the Ramaphosa administration is uh, the uh, allowing, or I'm still not, I'm not sure how far it is along now, but allowing private providers to, I think it's 100 megawatts, provide that to the grid. And I think that's something that's got to happen as a, a you know, matter of urgency. But uh, it's also... And I think we also need to let uh, uh, the municipalities need to look at ways that they can also produce electricity. I know Cape Town's looking to it. I think surprisingly, uh, Kuruli anyway, our state is also looking to it. So it's one of these things that, you know, and without electricity, the, any hope of having a South Africa that grows at five or six percent, it's it's actually it's a complete to, you know, it's it's pie in the sky. It's, electricity is the lifeblood of any modern economy, and at the moment, South Africa doesn't have that. And uh, but even it, it, uh, another issue is if ESCOM, I think they also need to be honest with people. They need to say, look, it's going to take us two years to fix everything. We're going to have low trading for two years. 
And I think most people would accept that if they knew at the end of the two years, there's going to be no load shedding. And if load shedding is, uh, it's, uh, what's what I'm for predictable. So if you know on Monday morning, you're not going to have electricity from 10 to 12, that's fine. You can deal with it. If you work from home, one of the cases, you can go to a coffee shop or a company can make a plan. I mean, still, still going to, uh, you know, have, um, it's still going to disrupt the economic activity, but I think companies can then work around it. Maybe they can, you know, if they know electricity is going to be off till 10 in the morning, they can tell the employees cool, come in a bit later and work a bit later, whatever the case is. But I think, you know, this is an easy solution. It's not something we can just click our fingers and everything will be fine tomorrow. And I, I, I've said, I think, uh, Paul, the underwriter, he's, he's probably got the worst job in South Africa. I mean, the, the poor guys are, are hiding to nothing. But I think all things considered, he's done a fairly good job. It looks uh, from um, open to correction, but I think he has reduced ESCOM's debt, a, uh, you know, a bit. Uh, but he's also, I think he's fighting against some fifth columnists within his organization. It seems yeah. pretty obvious that there's, you know, people who are actually trying to sabotage ESCOM, which is, it's actually mind boggling. I mean, oh. you, I mean, in a, for a country that's not at war, it's not facing a real terrorist threat to have people in one of, you know, whether we like to like it or not, ESCOM is one of the most important uh, entities in South Africa. And we have people in it who are sabotaging it and outsiders, you know, for whatever reason, it's the RET faction, the NC or whatever the case is. But that's something that's very worrying. And I think that's something that needs to be combated. And yeah, I don't envy Paul the underrated at all. Well, Tien, I had to throw yeah. it back to you because there was a comment that I put on screen here by uh, Richard Lemer or Lemer. Um, you know, it's a common view, right? And I, I subscribe to half yeah. of it um, and a partial bit of the second one, which is sell ESCOM to a private company <laughs> and get rid of the labor units. But now here's the thing. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm from I, a labor I, union. <laughs> yeah, I, was about to, I was about to say, it, 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 labor unions aren't necessarily the whole, when someone says labor unions, it's not the whole picture. Not all unions take a adversarial approach um, to you know relations between them and employees, and actually unions play an important part in representing those workers and their rights in the workplace. But of course, there has to be something said about the adversarial unions. Often the unions that are yoked to the ANC that are Marxist in their ideological nature. Yeah, even um, most of the Marxist unions um, realize that without the employer, there is no employee to represent. Most of them recognize that, but um, some simply don't and really do go into um, negotiations with the with the kind of um, win or lose type thing. There can't be a situation in their minds where both um, win. Whereas we go out with the idea that um, both parties have to be sufficiently taken care of and um, not endanger their livelihoods. I mean, if the company's livelihood dies, then obviously it's not good for our members, not good for South Africa. And yeah, on that note, I also have to say, I'm not entirely convinced by the splitting ESCOM into three separate entities idea. It seems like a good idea, but remember, then you'll have um, three different entities with three boards of directors that have to be compensated with three different tender processes that um, then have to be policed. So I'm not entirely convinced that that's the best idea. Because um, if in the end you'll then have three broken entities instead of one. But, and all the um, benefits that would come with that, like opening up the um, electricity market to new role players, um, mm would um is achievable now it's more a um, legislation problem than an escom problem and i mean the grid for instance distribution it would be ridiculous to um take our grid and replace it with a private one because it's world class it's one of the best in the world there's no reason to replace it but then escom has to come to the table and say look um we're willing to lay cables right now to any new power station be it owned by us owned by the state itself or any oh. private entity or uh, yeah i mean we can solve the um problem right now at this very moment um by um just bringing back some of his lost skills i mean South African engineers who left ESCOM solved the energy crisis in Dubai. They solved it in the Philippines when Fukushima um, flushed away in a tsunami. They even had a hand in helping Japan within one year set up a brand new um, world-class, best-in-the-world um, nuclear facility. So, 
Yeah, if we can just bring back those skills. We had, I think it was 2009, they stopped our nuclear program completely within a few hours. All those um, um, engineers and scientists who got laid off um, had new jobs. And if we were to um, purchase new nuclear facilities from elsewhere, we would be buying South African technology. Mm. Uh, yeah. You know, you, you hit the nail on the head. And, and Gabriel, I'm going to come to you. You'll wrap up the segment. We must move on. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the Utiens makes an important point here. Sometimes you don't actually have to reinvent the wheel. And the emphasis at times um, of, of trying to save ESCOM is, is almost, it's, it's a futile exercise. It's a per it'll be a pyrrhic victory for those in ESCOM because it will come at a great cost, effectively. Actually, what you maybe want to do is just open up the market, relegate ESCOM to transmission, um, allow municipalities perhaps to become the retailers of electricity, uh, in including also the purchase of, of it directly, um, and allow the private sector to hop on and remove these 100 megawatt limitations, for example. Yeah, um, yeah. just on that note. Sorry, um, Tienzia. Before we move on, basically the only part of ESCOM that's still 100% good is the grid, the distribution yeah. part. The, Transmission. The, selling yeah. distribu um, the end line marketing of it is a wreck. Uh, that's where much of the corruption is occurring, where um, people find ways to um, sell tokens um, and then you get double what you paid for, but ESCOM doesn't get all that money back. So generation is a mess and, and um, sales is a mess. Yeah. Literally only distribution that's still good. Gabriel? And distribution, so distribution is a natural monopoly. Uh, mm. You don't want a natural monopoly to be sitting in the hands of a private company because that private company uh, will uh, extract uh, super economic profits. So, Sitla, I completely agree with you that if we, and with and with the and with, let's bring in more competition, both at the municipal end user level and at the generation level, where a municipality might get involved in well, and I do think that it's the biggest middle finger that the Western Cape could give to national government to basically get rid of load shedding in the Western Cape and starting in, in, in Cape Town because it's, it is so, it's so clear. It's as clear as a, as a street light at night, you know, what a difference it makes good governance versus bad. And there has been progress on that. There are two schedules less than the rest of the country and they'll keep going. Uh, Morris and my, Morris and I share a colleague, Michael Morris, who didn't have load shedding for two years, <laughs> for two whole years in his particular corner of ESCO. He admitted that and, and ruined the day. Nice. <laughs> 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 Yo, we all had to make fun of him <laughs> for enjoying that. But, but look, there is a, there is a, there's another side to the story. And maybe this is a place to, to, to finish this a kind of gloomy place, but, but there's something to it. <sighs> One of the, with, with electricity, as Mario said, it's the lifeblood of any economy. It's got huge overheads. That's part of what makes the, that utility uh, so often run by governments. And, and part of that is the power play of governments, but part of that is something much simpler. When you've got huge overheads, one of your biggest costs is going to be servicing your debt. How much does it cost you to borrow money? Well, it always is going to cost the government less than everyone else because governments have the ability to invent money and to take police to take other people's money. That's called taxation. That's a nasty way to put it, but they have that power to extract tax and they've got the power through the printing press metaphorically to create surpluses. That means governments theoretically should always be able to borrow more cheaply than private companies that are domiciled within those governments. Now, sometimes governments are so mad that it's not true. And one of those examples was in late apartheid era, government debt was more expensive, oddly enough, than ESCOM debt. Because uh, people thought maybe the country will go into civil war and then the government won't repay its debt, but ESCOM will still be around because South Africans will need electricity. And that was true for a long time. Now those have flipped a little bit. But the point is, if you want private companies to climb in and really produce at a level that can compete with the South African government. They'd need to be borrowing, not in rands, 
but they'd be hoping to collect their money in rands. That's not going to make a lot of sense in terms of worrying about your cash flow and currency uh, fluctuations. Uh, and if they borrow in rands, they're going to be borrowing at higher interest rates than the government can borrow. So in the long term, I do think that countries that have tried to go full privatization or competition in their, in their grids have found that that makes a difference and it can make the government wake up a little bit in terms of that section that it does retain control over. But it's but as far as I can tell, it's it's almost never a, a, a total solution uh, because of the because of the debt equity question, and and so that leads us to the place where like part of what has to change is just the way government works in general, and I do think that 2021 <clears throat> taught us a lesson, which is that the ruling party can drop below 50 percent, and if it keeps going in the same direction, you could have a different coalition in the union buildings and in parliament that kind of thing is also not a silver bullet but in conjunction i think those things could work together to solve this problem and it's part of like a, a deeper issue that i find sometimes with the courts as well sometimes south africans want the courts to solve all our problems and the courts sometimes do but then they take strain the more you want the private sector to come and solve all the problems, the more strain you put on the private sector in terms of the crony capitalism relationships that they can then get into because they're inevitably in a space where they're selling to a government distributor and, and, and a municipal reticulator. That is also a place full of corrupt possibilities. So I like that direction. We have to go in that direction. But on top of that, we need something more, which is South Africans to get together and vote in a new dispensation. Oh, absolutely. And with that being said, we've just hit that, uh, well, we're nearly at the 40-minute mark, uh, which would nearly make it the halfway mark of the show. Mate, welcome to it. This is Liberty and Friends. Guys, do me that big, solid hit that like button. Trust you me, it really helps get the show out to a much wider audience. Do it now, whether you're watching on Twitter, Facebook, or on YouTube. I'm in conversation tonight with a um, very wonderful panel, actually. It's a smooth panel, very smooth drinking, this one. <laughs> Tien's de, uh, de Busen. Uh, Tien's, help me. And do we song? Do we song? There we go. Sorry. <laughs> My bad. Uh, <laughs> Tens de Dubusson, who is, of course, from the trade union Solidarity. Shout out to him for joining us. He is a new face here and definitely will, be, will not be the last time he is here. Gabriel Krauser, who is, of course, from the um, uh, co-host, pardon me, of Two Crickets in a Thorn Tree and also um, Thorn Bush. Um, and also one, uh, he's the head of campaigns, pardon me, at the Institute of Race Relations. I have no idea why my brain uh, stuttered there for a moment. Uh, Morris Root, I see giggling away behind his hand, who is, of course, from the Daily Friend publication. He's the deputy editor out in that part of the world. And, of course, oh, Tim Flack. There he is. Good evening to all my guests tonight as we move on um, to another issue, fellas. You know, and we'll get to Joe Rogan. We'll get to all of those headline issues. The truck is in Canada in a moment. I do want to prosecute um, some of these local issues first because, hey, last week, Monday, guys, sneaky, sneaky, this government quietly passed new regulations, new level one regulations. And one of those new regulations is a ominous one, if anything. The ability the government is giving itself to almost forcefully isolate or quarantine someone in this country. Gabriel, I, I'm going to come to you just to set it out. What exactly did they pass here? And Marius, I'll come to you after that. Yeah, thank you, Sitle. Marius might have to help me out on the details, but as far as I can make out, what the, gov what, what the command council in our so-called yeah. democracy did uh, together with cabinet, which is the same thing, but under a different name, uh, is to repeal even more of the regulations that are, that are obviously getting in the way of us living our lives in the ordinary fashion. And one of the good things is that schools finally can get back into the business of teaching children. Okay. Until now, schools have partly been teaching children and partly doing an interesting bureaucratic dance where you figure out how many children are allowed to come in and how many have to stay away and how many gigabytes of information do you have to transmit through internet services that don't work to places that don't have internet, uh, uh, using teachers that don't know how to operate machines that don't exist because they got stolen in the first place. It was very, very uh, sort of dadaist, absurd play for South mm -hmm. Africa to try virtual learning 
uh, in a school system that can barely put bricks on top of each other uh, to make classrooms. Uh, mm. we, we, we decided to go digital, um, uh, despite the evidence. Uh, anyway, th there were lots of debates about how that was supposed to go. The point is that kind of thing was repealed. Further lifting of restrictions uh, in, in other aspects of our life. Restrictions maintained, but somewhat relaxed, but still there in terms of large event gatherings, including out of doors, despite uh, the sort of uh, clear evidence of how other countries have managed to open up their sports stadia um, and with similar levels of antivirus. I call antivirus what happens if you've been infected and you recover or you got vaccinated and so you've got a boosted immune system. Uh, you know, countries with antivirus as much as ours have managed to clearly go and watch sports matches and, and give the entertainment and tourism sectors a bit of a boost through that without creating super spreader events, which is interesting, but also not surprising given it's out of doors and so on and so forth. So some restrictions remain there, but there is this new imposition of we're going to we're going to drop track and trace. So if you've been tested positive, but you're not showing signs of symptom test, you're, you're not sort of sneezing and coughing into people's faces, then we're not going to contact trace you, which is hilarious. I mean, how many times have South Africans gone and filled out those forms and nothing has happened uh, with the forms that they filled out? There was no track and trace anyway. But instead, you have this new um, discretionary power to put people in basically in hospital prison. Uh, and uh, I, I think that the rules around it, as far as I can read, the rules around it are vague enough that it's basically going to come down to the discretion of whoever uh, sits above you. And I think that's a nice little microcosm of, of the broader position that the command council holds over all of us. Which is right now, it's not doing much, but it's still sitting on top of our heads, and so it always has the power to 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 poke us, or like a dragon that that used to terrorize the village by blowing fire all over it. Uh, it retreats into its lair, but it hasn't been taken out, so um, it it can take flight again at a moment's notice. Well, you know, Morris, I must bring you in here because there's also a, a, a you know, what, what I think really frightened a lot of people was the, the introduction of these layered, a new layer of bureaucracy um, uh, leaning towards, as Umari, uh, pardon me, as U -U Gabriel said, empowering officials and really the state to be able to com command someone isolating. Yes, they say, oh, through a court order or actually through a court, like a special form that will now be created. Uh, do I just quickly talk us through that? And of course, the dangers of this and even the necessity of this all. Well, um, I'm not sure if you guys remember, but uh, this isn't actually new in South Africa. Uh, oh. the, we had uh, cases, uh, I'm not sure what ever happened with it, but uh, people who had a, a thing called XDRTB, extremely drug resistant tub tuberculosis could be locked up against their will. And people were kept in basically uh, hospital prisons for up to six months. And mm. uh, I was uh, actually um, reading a bit about it the other day. And uh, as one of the scientists at the time said, this is actually not a way to fight an illness or an epidemic or whatever the case is. Number one, you can't hold people against their will when they've done nothing wrong. It's not their fault they got ill. You can't say to people, restrict their freedom of movement and say, you have to stay up for six months. You know, you can't do that. And also what was very interesting, they were saying a lot of people who did have XDRTB were not symptomatic. So they didn't cough or whatever. And as the person was saying, I can't remember this particular scientist's name. If you are not coughing, even if you do have the disease, whether it's TB or COVID or whatever the case is, obviously they didn't know about COVID then. <coughs> if you're not coughing, you are not going to give the disease to anybody if you don't have any symptoms. Oh. So you can go and you should be able to go carry on with your life and so on. So overall, I mean, uh, we, we basically back to we basically back to normal with uh, COVID and everything. But uh, I think this is quite a worrying development. And uh, and also, it still boggles my mind how many people are so happy for the government to tell you what to do. Most people, and this is what happened before we had COVID. If some, if you were sick, if you got the flu or cold, even just a mild cold, and you were sneezing a bit, you generally stayed at home. You don't want to go out because number one, you wouldn't feel well. Number two, you don't want to make other people uh, ill. So you'd go and you'd, uh, you know, you'd stay at home and this, this would be the same, the exact same thing now with things like COVID. And we know now that, uh, you know, most people in South Africa have either been, we, we have 60 to 80 percent immunity in South Africa now. It looks from the seroprevalence tests, whether it's from people who've been infected by COVID before or through vaccinations and whatever. So the vast majority of people are now protected against COVID. So it's time to actually, actually I think we need to get rid of 
basically all these um, uh, regulations. And people, if they want to wear masks, they should be allowed to. You know, if you want to wear a mask, that's your decision. But there shouldn't be a law saying you have to wear a mask. And if people want to sanitize, of course, you know, take all the precautions that you want to. But the government should not be telling us what we need to do. And I think that's, you know, it's and the fact that we are in this new regulation where the government can lock people up for not actually doing anything, for not committing a crime or anything, and the government's allowed to lock you up. It's actually, it's it's absurd. And it's not something that we should allow. Well, Tim, l- let me come to you, Tim, because, you know, I've just opened up another article here. And let me just quickly... Uh, fix the screen so you guys can maybe it might be a bit more legible uh you know joe parker the minister of health there he is in all his glory um saying masks are here to stay for now says the health minister um under level uh under level one of the lockdown the wearing of masks in public is mandatory uh for those of you who are still wearing them i thought uh <laughs> But um, here's the kicker for me, which I found a, a little bit slippery, almost um, uh, snake-like, if anything. Responding to questions from the media, this is the kicker. Pacha, that's the minister, said that the government, quotes had not been advised on getting rid of the mask mandates. This is clearly a lie. When you consider that just a few months ago, that very same medical advisory committee or members of it, some influential members of it, um, and Morrison, I just need to get to a, a reminder, he was on the CRA recently. Uh, is it Professor Mahdi, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, Shabir Mahdi, I think about it. Shabir Mahdi himself yeah. had said, hey man, mm-hmm. these masks are absolutely not, they're, they're not worth it in the South African climate. We have a situation here, uh, uh, Tim, where the state is clearly listening to those uh, it it wants to if it serves its interests and not really the interests of citizens. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I mean, you look look at uh, countries all over the world that are doing away with the masks in public um, and wearing of masks out uh, out in public anyway. So uh, this is just government trying to exercise their their control and... um, just watch people uh, just watch people listen to them and it's it's quite sad that the south african public is just sort of going ahead with this sort of stuff um mm. i mean for example the new regulations contain a form that can be used by magistrates to order people into isolation and it includes the order allowing for the taking of samples from the person's body um they can also appoint whoever they like uh, so that could be your neighbor, that could be the, the nosy auntie across the street uh, to be the, the, the sort of COVID police uh, in your neighborhood, and police will be able to order someone to isolate. Um, it, it's ridiculous, and, and, and we're just sitting back and, and accepting it. Uh, something small like masks, um, people should be allowed to choose whether they want to wear masks. I know, I, I know for example, this, uh, my, my partner, for example, is uh, a little bit concerned about, about germs, and that's Sort of stuff so they for, for to sort of make them feel a little bit better um, they, they would choose to wear a mask themselves uh, me for example I'm not so I'm not so phased and I'm not so convinced about it so I mean whether I want to wear a mask or not it should be up to me and the only re- the only way we're going to get rid of these uh, ridiculous uh, overreaching laws is is by ending the national state of disaster um, at getting behind campaigns that are, that are calling for it. Like, for example, um, Solidarity Afri Forum and Dear South Africa have, have recently launched a, a court case to to do away with the national state of disaster. Um, and I mean, there, there, there's uh, public participation processes up. If you go to dearsouthafrica.ca.za um, forward slash state hyphen of hyphen disaster, you can go oh. and have your say and it'll go to government and, and, and you can have your say and tell government look this is ridiculous uh can we do away with this you can also support the organizations with their court cases um and, and it's sad to see these these campaigns um that do go up that are meaningful um it, it went up the other day and there's only 3692 uh, comments so far so um it the south african public is weird when it comes to gun laws for example when we had gun law campaigns up and running there were millions of people jumping on board and now something that that has quite a quite an effect on our, our quite a big impact on our liberties and and how we conduct our daily lives and businesses um and one kind of sits back and goes oh well i'll wear a mask anyway or i'll i'll accept the fact that a magistrate can order my I can can order medical experimentation on me 
against the the Bill of Rights because that's what it is. It's, 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 you know, they're doing experiments on you if they're taking samples. They're, they're taking that sample to do an experiment to see whether you've got COVID or not. Uh, and that's unconstitutional, and we, we just sort of accept it. Yeah. What frightens me most, Tienz, I'm going to come to you because I want to throw this bone at you in particular. For me, this issue has definitely become a class one, uh, one which is also segmented via the elites and what the, the poorer segments of our society have to be relegated to. Let me be precise and specific by way of an example. You walk into a restaurant, in my case, I walk into a restaurant without a mask, um, or I walk into a mall without a mask, immediately I'm trailed by you know five or four security guys, each demanding, eh, sir, sir, please, please, just put the mask on. And I don't do that. Um, you, you know, and again, I, I'm mindful though, even even if, as I say this, I'm mindful of the fact that who is sicked onto me, it is the, you know, minimum wage security guard who must mm. now confront, you know, the fat, black, big bearded, Bin Laden beard, uh, big daddy Liberty walking his way and waltzing his way. Uh, through a mall. Worse yet, I sit in a restaurant, uh, you know, I, I take my mask off, and who's serving me? Again, the minimum wage chap forced to wear that damn thing, um, you know, for an entire uh, uh, waitressing shift. Uh, 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 this this really has a class component, and really, it's almost as if the snobbish political elites are going, yes, you plebs, uh, it puts the mask on its face or else it gets the lockdown regulations again. Yeah, no, it's actually, I find it quite disgraceful um, how complacent people just are. Like, um, we know now that masks do little to none, and um, unless it's a proper medical grade mask that goes, comes with an entire hazmat suit, um, unless you're wearing one of those, you're not really protected. I think the surgical masks that we wear is something like a 5% difference which is a lot more than nothing. But I think at this point, it's um, fairly negligible, especially if as soon as you're out of sight, you pull the thing off and it doesn't really serve any purpose anymore. But yeah, the um, state of emergency or state of disaster goes even further than that. I mean, um, while it's in place, the police can search your car and even your house without a warrant if they um, suspect anything. And I mean, no one's talking about that are basic liber liberties that we take for granted as mm. being stripped away. And people are just totally complacent. And I never realized how bad it was. I still remember a couple of years ago while I was reading for my master's degree, I um, read in an article that most people, if given a choice between freedom and security, would rather give up freedom and that in exchange for security and i thought ah nonsense can't be I actually got a fright reading it and thought there are really people like that and COVID made me realize it's really it's true most people are like that i mean um tim you know how many people went and handed in their um guns when the state said they had to and uh, we'll probably see more of that um just people would really go to massive extents to harm themselves in order to keep the state happy. And it's Absolutely. nothing short of disgraceful. Mm. Guys, I must move us on because I'm a little bit short on time. No, uh, I do. Gabriel, please, I can I say you? a tiny thing? Tiny okay, thing. give me two seconds. Give me two, two seconds. Just to remind you, please, you're watching Liberty and Friends. Hit that like button. We're just discussing the issue of, uh, well, it's, it's broadened out now <laughs> to be about masks and really, if anything, lockdown and non-pharmaceutical interventions and how they encroach on your freedom. Good point made by Tienz there. The debate being between your freedom, really, and the notion of safety or safetyism um, on behalf or by uh, by the state. Uh, uh, Gabriel? Okay, so uh, one thing anecdotally, I think, Sitle, you, dude, you're absolutely right. This has become a class issue. To wear a mask is an indication that whatever that environment is, you're relatively lower down on the power scale. And to not wear a mask, you're higher up. And as an interesting uh, manifestation of this, and I can't talk about the trial very much, today I was in court uh, in the matter between AFRI Forum and the EFF uh, regarding the singing of of uh, Shoot to Kill, uh, Dubula Ibunu, uh, at Senegal, where Sitla and I were both 
uh, uh, covering that that story. Anyway, I just found it as a background curiosity quite interesting that the rules of engagement, and I can understand why this is not at all a criticism of the court, that all of that the judge and the and the advocates and the attorneys were not wearing masks, and then everyone else was wearing a mask. It was such a clear reflection of the power scale of that room. And it is like the restaurant, but of course, it's sort of, it's like layered up. And so you're going to find yourself in a room where you're the guy wearing the mask. Oh, you're happy in the restaurant. You don't have to wear the mask because you're buying the dinner. You get, the shoe's going to land on the other foot. It would make more sense, I think, scientifically right now for us to, to, to relax that to the point where it really is just your choice. Oh. As you say, people can choose to do what they want to do. But... Um, it's going to take some push. And the best, I saw this comment, someone said, you know, something to the effect of those in charge are not going to give our freedoms back. We have to mm -hmm. stand up and take them back. Mm -hmm. So to reflect on what Tim, what Tim said, um, we've been watching, we, we started a campaign to disband the command council in the state of disaster and change the law so that this can't ever happen again last year uh, in October. And we have, uh, I think over 20,000 signatures supporting that campaign, <coughs> but over 10,000 supporting our campaign to oppose vaccine mandates. Um, we've plugged that a lot in the show, so I'm not going to push too hard on it again. I really appreciate a lot of the support that's come through Big Daddy Liberty. Uh, big shout out. Um, but that's rolling on through, and we laid a paper trail with our attorneys that should be useful in court. We plan to make that useful to whatever judge or justices consider what I consider to be a completely absurd dispensation uh, oh. that we currently live under. But the, the, the heart of it is this, this dichotomy between freedom and security. It is true. You ask people, do you want one or the other? And, and most people give the wrong choice. But you can still work with those people because it is a false dichotomy. It's a dichotomy that lasts for five minutes. If you put your trust in a dictator... You might as well put your head in the mouth of a lion. For five minutes, you might be safe because the lion's recently eaten. Recently, that lion has eaten our freedoms, and so currently it's letting us run around and do what it wants. But we remain in its mouth. It can close its jaws at any moment. It can tell us when to go to sleep again. It can tell us how many cigarettes we're allowed to smoke or whether we're allowed to drink alcohol or whether we're allowed to wear bikinis or go into the beach or buy open-toed shoes or get hot food next to the flip and take out aisle. All of those things that the command council has done, it can do again. And guess what? It can do much worse. It can, under this dispensation, hide the 15 billion in irregular spending. It can drive forward nationalization of our entire private healthcare sector. It can use the pretext of not being able to e evict people which is currently, you know, like a disaster thing, uh, to further entrench expropriation without compensation. It can use all of this as a backdrop to prescribe assets. As If you're in a disaster, you can prescribe assets, take pension funds, invent more money through the Reserve Bank, quantity easing. Every single bad idea that the ANC has come up with in the last 25 years is all the more easy to implement when it's under a command council dictatorial regime rather than us operating like a democracy. So this is not about one thing. Masks are important, but it's a microcosm. This is literally about everything. And we have to put it to bed. We have to we have to kill the command council. Let the people oh. stand. But that organization must go. Absolutely. And with that being said, we have to be on the go. That is going on to the next topic, but one which is linked, if anything, to uh, this issue that Gabriel is, is raising here which is the notion that someone has to begin to push back. And that someone is you. There's no savior that's coming to save you. Yes, there are these various organizations that are doing fantastic work advocating for your, your civil liberties. But really, the defense of life, liberty, and property rights is your responsibility. We're seeing that uh, around the world by way of, for example, the Canadians and the, the truck or the freedom... Uh, convoy 2022, the trackers in that part of the world who actually said, this is it. This is where we draw the line in the sand. And fellas, I must bring it back to that conversation we just had it, it, of this topic being an assault of the elites versus the ordinary working Joe, or in our case, the, the poor in this country. In this case, the poor standing up and saying, actually, this is here 
and no further. Uh, Gabriel, even as I say this, or let me throw it to Tim. Sorry, Tim, it's been a while. Um, you know, even as I say this, there, there, there is a conversation to be had. Uh, and I, I sort of cheekily put it up uh, last week in a tweet. And I said, you know, if you saw a, a coalition of South African taxi drivers and owners, uh, the farmers in this country, and broadly speaking, you know, civil society, getting into their cars, turning that key and saying, we're going to Pretoria, we're going to shut it down until they end the state of disaster. The lawyer that all Gabriel is talking about, who they've just commissioned, would not even make it into court to serve those papers before the state itself comes out and says, you know what, we need to end this thing. Uh, these taxi drivers ain't playing around. Uh, you know, I, I trivialize it and I make a joke out of it, but it really is true. Because if you look at it from this way, uh, perspective, Tim, and I want you to chime in here, taxi drivers and taxi owners have really been at the forefront, if anything, of showing the rest of us that civil disobedience is very much okay, and insofar as defending your rights is necessary. And if anything, instead of us scoffing at them, we should be learning from the taxi guys. No, yeah, no, exactly. That's it. that's exactly it. But unfortunately, I think uh, the the South African in general is tired of uh, of fighting, or have, have sort of lost their fighting spirit um, throughout the years. We spent uh, decades and decades fighting for the end of apartheid, and we spent decades fighting uh, against the ANC. It's almost like we, as as South Africans, have just given up. Um, in terms of doing serious fight. And when you come to the taxi industry, the taxi industry is obviously heavily influenced by, by government uh, in some as aspects. Um, it would be great to see everyone get together and get along. But I've seen in, um, in, in the gun lobby and I've seen in, in, other, in, in other sort of industries that I've worked with, uh, we have a very hard time as, as different sectors or different groupings of people to stand together against something. For some reason, we, we, we've lost the ability to, to band together and go, listen, enough is enough. We're all going to do this and we're going to get it done. I don't think we'll see anything like, uh, like the Freedom Convoy in South Africa anytime soon uh, because Ooh. of that. I think uh, it's just not – we've lost that uh, we've lost that chiss and that fight um, and just become too complacent. We're just going to sit there. And if there is something that's going to be so small – uh, it'll it will it'll be insignificant in terms of actually making any change. Oh. Morris, let me bring you in because even as I say this, you know, Tim has a point. Not only is there a lack of that chaos, if I can uh, borrow from his expression, but it goes beyond that. There's also the real fear. Uh, you know, people do the calculations. There's a real fear of the state clamping back. You know, the state in our case being the South African one, which is pretty useless at that. Um, but of those, it will catch those individuals do feel as though, hey, man, I, I might have a lot to lose in this instance. Let me bring it back to the Canadians, because I think that's what, that's what I wanted to chat about. You know, uh, we're now seeing, uh, Marius, the Canadian government, uh, pardon me, correction, the Ottawa police, that's the uh, capital city of, 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 of Canada, the police force, they're basically saying, we're now clamping down on the free expression of these protesters by doing a myriad of things from banning uh, the supply of food or uh, heating, uh, which is gas for them, and of course, uh, diesel to these truckers and a myriad of other things. If you're seen supporting them, you will be arrested, says the Ottawa chief. He even went as far as reaching out to, uh, you know, uh, uh, funding platforms such as GoFundMe, and that's who I wanted to touch on, on this, a corporation that facilitates donations uh, and passes it on to beneficiaries to say, hey man, um, we're, we the police are deeming this a occupation and not a protest, and on that basis, don't give them the money. Yeah, no, I think uh, that was uh, disgraceful. And what is actually most disgraceful about GoFundMe, they said uh, they're not going to allow you to fund, the, you know, give money for the truckers' protest. But then they said, unless you actually come and ask for a refund, they're going to decide where that money goes to. They're going to give it to other charities, which, I mean, that's basically theft, actually. But apparently yeah. now lawyers have uh, gone to GoFundMe and they pushed back it. They said, okay, you don't have to ask for a refund. I'll give you back the money anyway. But uh, I was also reading, um, mo most Canadians are actually, they, uh, they're they not against mandates, they pro vaccines and so on, but that doesn't matter. Uh, if there's only 5% or 10% of Canadians that are against mandates, they have the right to protest against it. 
and that's what we're seeing now. I mean, it's, uh, at the, I can't remember who said it, but if there's only if, if the whole world agrees on one thing, and there's one man out of the entire world's population who is opposed to it, there's you still do not have the right to say to that guy, you do not have the right to make your voice heard. And I think that's what's happening with this truckers protest. From it seems quite a mixed bag there. A lot of the people seem to be quite well behaved, and they just protest against the mandates. And then you see there have been some uh, apparently reports of guys, you know, attacking people wearing masks and some racial slurs and so on. But also, who knows, this is maybe just the misinformation coming from uh, certain quarters and what have you. And then I've also seen there have been Canadian flags with swastikas drawn on them. But then I've also seen a clip where there was a man with a Confederate flag and he was chased away by the truckers. Mm -hmm. so I didn't want his, uh, you know, that type of person, uh, uh, what's them protesting with him. So but whatever you think about the truckers protest, and even their behavior, just because there's a couple of bad eggs doesn't mean that the process itself doesn't have, uh, is, is invalid. Uh, but as I say, most Canadians, from what I've been reading, are pro-mandates, they're pro-vaccines and so on. But that does not mean that these trackers aren't allowed to protest and that they don't have the right to protest. And it's actually, it's a complete disgrace. You know, I mean, I think a good, a good comparison is the Black Lives Matter protests. Whatever you think mm. about the Black Lives Matter movement, people are, of course, allowed to protest for it and against police brutality in the U.S., but we also saw there was lots of violence related to those protests. But then there's, from, from certain quarters, it seemed, you know, that, that kind of violence was okay, but you can't go and honk your horn in the in downtown Ottawa. Suddenly, that is a horrible thing to do, but you can go <laughs> burn down the whole of, you know, I don't know, uh, Minneapolis or whatever, you know, whatever, the, or uh, uh, what's it, uh, in Wisconsin there, that, that uh, one city mm. where Carl Vettel mm, Kenosha. Yeah, Kenosha, mm. that's it. So just for me, there's these double standards, because whatever you think, as I say, whatever you think about the truckers' protest, they have a right to protest about things that they're not happy about. As long as they're not committing violence, it's all good, I think. And same as also with any protest, actually. You you have the right to go protest in democracy. You allow to make your voice heard. You don't always just have to wait your four or five years to go make your voice heard at the ballot oh. box. It's your right to go to the to the people who govern you and say, I disagree with this, and this is why, and do whatever kind of extra parliamentary activity as long as not violence, as I say. So, but mm. it's been, it's actually been a complete disgrace. And, you know, I think uh, Justin Trudeau is not coming out of this uh, looking very good, I don't think. Absolutely. As I come to you, Tienz, because there's a conversation to be had here, you know, often the left, broadly speaking, have always historically been, uh, has always historically positioned itself as being the champion of the working class, the voice of the working class. Marx himself argued that it would be the working class or the proletariat to then rise up and then deem a small elite amongst themselves, what he called the vanguard of the working class, who then decipher you know, what the, the, the broader uh, uh, class wants uh, by way of, of state power. Um, you know, and, and if I can take it one step further, uh, expressing themselves in unions, most unions being leftist and really Marxist in nature, um, have ma always made the argument, yeah, workers need to get their voice out, they need to be heard, they need to be at the forefront of the people's struggle. Uh, you hear often Kasatu saying this. In Canada, the workers finally decide to do that, and it's the same unionists and the same leftists saying, no, please, stop honking, how dare you yeah. try and uh, raise your voice and be heard. Yeah, same people who refer to the um, BLM um, movement saying it's mostly peaceful and therefore fine, but people honking is just too much. Yeah, <laughs> um, lots of memes going around with um, people saying workers of the world unite and then Canada protest and saying, no, not like that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, really strange things that we're seeing. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, the labor uh, organized labor is um, predominantly um, run by um, leftists or Marxists. Actually, you get two oh. major traditions in um, in the um, labor union movements. It's the Marxist tradition and the, the Christian tradition. In South Africa, oh. we're the only major open um, union um, representing multiple um, multiple um, fields of um, work and. Um, trades that um, are from the Christian tradition. Um, not that everyone's as um, fixed to their Marxist ideals in every scenario, but in the end, domination and uniting the workers for a leftist goal seems to be the ultimate goal. And unfortunately, that's become um, very much politicized worldwide, where you see this 
hierarchy where if it's for um, the rights of minorities or trans people, then it's cool. Then burn down a city. But once it's for, once it's for freedom and it goes against the st state ter tyranny, then suddenly it's a problem. And now we have to step back and these are dangerous people. Like, uh, I mean, even um, the police in one Canadian town um, shared a photo of the word freedom um, spray painted on a wall. And they spread that and said, anti vax propaganda has been um, oh. sprayed in, on the walls of Ottawa. And then it's like, how on earth is the word freedom an anti vax propaganda word? Freedom oh. is all we have, and it's the last thing we should really protect um, absolutely I mean, anti -vax. Let, let, let me bring you in here gabriel because i want you to chew on this one from this particular angle because we introduced it earlier on and i was sort of angling towards it now by by raising the specter that it really has been a fight a a pushing back of the working class the poor in particular against these mandates and really the elites in the society saying, even as we impose difficulty on you, we the elites, we the establishments are actually quite comfortable. We can we can order Uber Eats and you know we can take this and that because we're fine under these lockdown conditions. What was you poor people? It's those poor and working class people who are now pushing back against the elites because they recognize the elites are actually not acting in their interests. This clip that I'm going to play, Gabriel, I want you to opine on it. Um, it's actually from the, I don't know who this lady is, but she was speaking at the World Economic Forum's Great Narrative Conference. Just listen to how this woman gives the game up and actually shows that, yes, it is a fight between the elites, or the establishment as I call them, and us, the rest of us, the faith, flag, family, and freedom lot. Just watch this, guys. At Davos a few years ago, you know, the Edelman survey showed us that the good news is the elite across the world trust each other more and more. So we can come together and design and do beautiful things together. The bad news is that in every single country they were polling, the majority of people trusted that elite less. So we can lead, but... <laughs> Dead giveaway. <laughs> Dead giveaway that actually That's they recognize that there is a growing angst, not just in Canada, guys, around the world. If anything, South Africa was a typecast of the, or it gave us an example of that uh, last year in July, where it was the poor who said enough with the, the, the yeah. lockdown, enough with us being relegated as secondary or second class citizens as we watch you in the elites enjoy creature comforts and people literally revolted. It's coming, Gabriel. Yeah, this is interesting. Okay, I want to. My view is complicated. So let me start out by saying, when I was sixteen years old, I was very privileged to be sent on a on a leadership camp in uh, Eglon, which is a, a school in Switzerland, and Gordonston, which is a school in Scotland, where the you know Prince Andrew and a bunch of royals have been. And Eglon was the most expensive high school in the world. So we could go and see how, and Zalem School in Germany, we could see how do these elites work. And this was done through a program called the Round Square. And it was invented basically after World War II by a German teacher at Zalem School who had secure, who had protected Jews at his school and tried to keep the school safe from the growing Nazi uh, movement. And uh, eventually, obviously, couldn't make it all the way and dodged out. And and then after that, he had this idea that if only more people in Germany and England and France and Italy and so on were talking to each other, had had experiences with each other, had relationships with each other, truly trusted each other. If only there was that connection. And it's inevitably going to be an elite connection because who else can afford to fly across and write the letters? If only they had that connection, they could have stopped World War II. So there is some benefit to, to a cosmopolitan kind of uh, universe, to, pe to people who jet setters and fly around and hook up with each other, because they can stop the silos from being erected, which cause wars. And let me tell you, when it comes to the elites in Ukraine and Russia, it's, there is a breakdown there which, which speaks to this point and the, and the kinds of strife that they're feeling. Likewise, there's very much a breakdown 
between Russia and the rest of the world. And that's why I think NATO feels so comfortable in pushing against them. So I do think that there's something useful about elites connecting. That being said, the most useful thing an elite is supposed to do is with its, with its benefits of high education, very expensive education and, uh, and extra tests and so on. Wonderful talent if you're lucky. An elite is supposed to guard against the encroachment of short-sighted, frankly stupid uh, self-destruction. That's what an elite is supposed to do. A decent elite is supposed to be able to spend the time that most people don't have because most people are plumbing or making the electricity work or, or driving the taxi from Durban to Peter Maritzburg. Most people are adding value. The elite is also supposed to add value. That is the basic test. Is it adding value to the society that it lives? If someone was given a million rand education, are they adding two million rand to the economy? Or are they sitting back and moaning in ways that make things worse? That's the test. Are you adding value or not? And and I think that this, this uh, Davos speaker clearly doesn't understand. She thinks that the two facts go together. The elites are connecting more internationally, and so they're losing the trust of, the, of, of local people. Local people don't hate elites because they get to go on holiday to Switzerland. Local people resent elites when they are destroying value. And that is what has happened under what I call the Soviet Union. This excuse made out of a virus to turn freedom on its head, to turn our lives upside down, to ignore science, to politicize every data point to the, to, to the extent that, that thinking out loud is illegal and thinking intelligently is positively like uh, 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 considered the, the, the worst thing that you can do because it goes against the narrative. It's, it's, it's sickening to me how, how, how low grade our elites are. So I am in the strange position where I don't want to burn it all. I don't want to burn the library. I don't want to burn the fire station. I'm not a fallist who were also anti-elitist in a way. I want people to be brilliant at science and discover new things about the origins of, of, of black holes. I want people to figure out more about how our brain works. I want someone to cure cancer. I want that very badly. And the person who cures cancer is going to be some kind of elite. But I want him to or her to cure cancer. I don't want to be stuck in a conversation about him and her uh, and, and all those categories that you're even allowed to think about. I don't want to be stuck in a world where, where I'm not allowed to go outside without wearing something, which scientifically we can't find proper evidence for justifying wearing it outside anymore. I, I, I really want South Africans and I really see people around the world being very angry at how badly our societies are being guarded or, or, or rather abused by the guardians. But I think that we must be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The thing is not to get rid of expertise and science and excellence and that kind of stuff. The thing to get rid of is the bureaucrat sitting in a position of power that's making things worse, that is betraying his or her oath of office, and that is completely turning their backs on the wisdom of the Enlightenment, which is that some people can figure some things out, and when they do, we all get to share the reward because that's the nature of intelligence. Intelligence is a warm glow that we all benefit from. It's not the enemy. Absolutely. Well put. And, you know, it, it, I, I must just caution everybody, guys, we're in the sort of last uh, near 10 minutes of the show. If you're willing to indulge me just an extra 15 minutes max, uh, it'll allow us to just finish off the last two topics, which really I think we must chew on. Um, let me bring us a little closer to home before we end off with the Joe Rogan uh, debacle. That'll be the last topic that we chew on uh, here. And for those in the comments, uh, I know I've had you waiting, but you you can hear it from the panel here. You are watching Liberty and Friends. I'm in conversation with Tim Flack. There he is at the top there, quite next to me. Uh, Marius Ruert from The Daily Friend. Gabriel Krauser uh, from uh, uh, the Institute of Race Relations. And of course, Tiens Dubusson. Um, I think I still butchered that, but I'll get it eventually. Uh, <laughs> um, from 
solidarity. We're in the last, let's call it, thir- uh, yeah, 25 minutes or so of the show, the final two issues, and we're, trans- uh, we're, we're, we're moving on to back here at home, guys. You know, the JSC interviews last week, that's the Judicial Services Commission interview, which is a body uh, that's made up of politicians and attorneys and the like, we're interviewing positions for various uh, 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 positions. Pardon me for various vacancies for judges, and of course the big one, uh, the uh, chief justice position, which has become available, of course, with the uh, with Wu Mekhuang finishing his term of office. Morris, let me come to you, Chief, because this JSC uh, interview was a very very amusing one, insofar as it got the talking heads in this country very riled up for various reasons (laughs) but really at the heart of it from what i could garner was the acrimonious and bitter uh, uh, exchanges between uh, committee members or commissioners rather and judges in particular judges who uh you know in some cases were ambushed on this particular commission a one dustin mlambo of course who's the current justice feeling very ambushed by a one uh, red and tooth and claw commie, that's Julius Malema, asking about, for example, allegations, r- random ones at that, of uh, sexual abuse. Um, another judge, Judge Zondo, seemingly targeted by commissioners. And the judge now who's been recommended by the JSC, uh, I can't f- remember her first name, but Maya, Justice Maya being, uh, uh, Judge Maya being her surname, uh, now having been recommended after being given sweetheart questions at this commission. Your reading of those uh, interviews last week? Uh, look, Sikhla, I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah? Uh, I think uh, watching those judicial interviews uh, is the same. If you enjoy a Vienna or Bravo sausage, you don't watch it uh, getting made because you're never going to eat a Vienna or Bravo sausage again. <laughs> uh, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I didn't uh, watch those interviews because I want to still have faith in our judiciary. So I thought it's probably better for my peace of mind if I don't watch those interviews. <laughs> but from what I could tell, uh, it, there was some disgraceful disgraceful behavior, especially from Dalion Porfrey and Julius Malema. I believe they brought up a, uh, an accusation of sexual harassment against uh, Dustin Malambo, uh, which he'd never heard uh, before. I'm not sure if it's Dustin or Dunstan, but uh, the accusation of sexual harassment, which he'd never, apparently never been brought up before. Uh, and, you know, was, uh, he, he was kind of blindsided in the interview. And it's also kind of one of those questions where, you know, Mr. Malambo, do you still beat your wife? Uh, no, I've never beat my wife. Then the headline is Malambo denies beating wife. And I mm. think it's the exact same kind of thing. It's to, you know, it's um, uh, just to discredit uh, the judiciary for whatever reason. But I was also reading uh, this uh, person who's been nominated, Maya. She's apparently had some uh, good decisions. She's apparently, she said that uh, Afrikaans wants to get taken away from at UNISA as a medium of instruction. So maybe just because she's the preferred candidate of people like Dalion Porfu and Julius Malema, we must maybe, you know, just uh, guilt her by association. Maybe she'll turn out to be a good, uh, good chief justice if she does get appointed to the position. But yeah, I think... Uh, the South African judiciary is in, uh, is, you know, facing some headwinds and is definitely something to be concerned about. I mean, you know, there's already lots of uh, talk about our judiciary <clears throat> being not as stable or as uh, strong as it could be and it's becoming a bit rickety. And, you know, if, if people don't trust in, ju- in the judiciary, we already know that South Africans have very little, uh, very low levels of trust in the police. Our levels of trust in judiciary are, are not too bad. They still... The last surveys I saw, they're about still about sixty percent of South Africans trust the judiciary, compared to about thirty percent to trust the cops. So, but if we start getting to thirty or forty percent levels of trust in, uh, you know, our courts, then we are, yeah, we we going down a very dark path. I think. Absolutely, and and Tim, I must throw it to you because you know, Maurice is absolutely correct. You know, I, I must separate the, the idea of, uh, you know, besmirching. Uh, Judge Mandi Samaya, who, that's the first name, Mandi Samaya, uh, besmirching her integrity simply because of the conduct of a one Julius Malema and Dalim Orful. Uh, judge, judge Maya, by all accounts, is a fantastic judge um, and really someone who, you know, I mean, she was also recommended by other parties uh, on that uh, c- c- commission. So that, that's not what I'm really r- railing against here. I'm just laughing, if anything, at how uh, the process played out and Again, the JSC itself coming under sharp uh, criticism 
or scrutiny for a clown world organization that it really is or committee or commission that it is politically fraught i think is the word the mail and guardian used as it then uh, revealed that the helen Sussman foundation had actually mentioned that it was carefully weighing a core challenge on the rationality of the judicial services commission uh hearings that culminated in the entity recommending uh the president appoint uh, the Supreme Court, Supreme, pardon me, Court of Appeals judge or President Mandisa Maya as the next chief. People forget that at the end of the day, the decision also still belongs to Cyril Ramaphosa. He can decide to uh, appoint someone else. Uh, Tim, you're muted. Sorry about that. I, I personally, I, I personally sort of uh, feel that this this lengthy public process was a fruitless and wasteful exercise. Um, yeah. Basically, it just it just showed that it was it was a waste of time uh, because the constitution actually doesn't allow for such a process. Um, the president, uh, by his own right, and <laughs> just notify the, the the JSC of his intention of who he wants to appoint. So mm. they can they can shout and scream they want Justice Maya then and uh, Uncle Cyril can turn around and go well actually guys I don't think I want uh, I don't want her there I'm gonna put this person and there's nothing that anyone can do about it because it's constitutional. Oh. Um, going to the, the the whole process I mean the chief toy, the the chief toy soldier and his little minion um, running around shouting and screaming it's it's just a political, uh, I call it uh, hairdryer politics. Uh, it's just very loud and hot air that gets shouted out. Malema's, uh, Malema's just trying to score brownie points for himself and he's not he's not doing himself any favours. Um, in terms of the sexual harassment uh, questions that were given to uh, um, That's Malambo, the Malambo. Um, yeah, in, 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 the, in, in, in the process of the work that I do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I'm privy to certain information from certain parties that are in, in, in quite uh, interesting places. And uh, one of my very, very first clients um, had mentioned that there was, there was some impropriety on his part in terms of, 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 of sexual harassment. Um, so whether it's true or not, we don't know, but uh, no one's ever laid a complaint and no charges have been laid. So the fact that, that Malema brought it up uh, is neither here nor there anyway. Um, it did sort of seem, though, that Maya was asked sort of almost patronizing questions, and and it mm -hmm. was it was more along the lines of her um, folk, the focus Agenda. was more on her being a woman, uh, the first mm. woman um, to hold a position rather than her fitness to hold a position. Um, mm. But at the again, we're, in this country, we make a huge thing out of nothing because at the end of the day, the constitution doesn't recognize such a process. And uh, Uncle Cyril at the end of the day and the president is going to turn around and he's going to say, listen, I don't agree or I do agree or whatever. But the decision ultimately lies with him. This was just cheap politicking and uh, it, it wasn't very impressive at all. Well, Gabriel, let me throw it to you and I'll, I'll ask you to be brief because Ulo, Tim makes an important point here. In the previous uh, 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 trial, or, sorry, or, or selection of a, a chief justice via the JSC, you know, the preferred candidate at the time was a one Justice uh, Moseneke and it was a head to head between him and who eventually got chosen by Jacob Zuma, Umukweng uh, Mukweng. So we're almost seeing, could there be a, could there rather, pardon me, be a, a replay of that same situation where the JSC recommends this dude, but the president says, eh, no, I'm going with this guy. Uh, yes and no. My view on uh, President Sir Ramaphosa, um, Uncle Squirrel, you know, many names he has on this show, <laughs> uh, is that he is... Uh, unlike Zuma in the sense that Zuma was more willing to sort of make a decision that didn't seem cool. Mm. Ramaphosa is more, it seems to try harder to sort of fit in with the crowd uh, that he's surrounded by. Um, I think he is more sensitive to pressure. And so he might not feel, uh, uh, you know, t Tim, Tim has a, 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 a sort of, uh, 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 a rather disdainful attitude towards public pressure, perhaps. Uh, but I, <laughs> and, and, and in many cases, I think that's apt. There are some people who don't care 
Uh, but some politicians really do. I think Cyril's one of them. I think he's going to find it <coughs> extremely difficult to go over this. Um, the second sense in which this is different, Cicli, and this is maybe the more important sense, is that in the debate between who's better, Mukhoeng or, or, or Moseneke, uh, a lot of it was about who would be more willing to stand up to Jacob Zuma. It was a question oh. about who has the independence to stand up to a personality. In my opinion, the one good thing that Saul Ramaphosa absolutely should have done for all South Africans is make them realize personality doesn't matter. Policy matters. You can have a pirate ship with a, with a one-legged pirate captain or a two-legged pirate captain, one who's speaking in a Scottish accent or an English accent, whatever. It's still a pirate ship. If the policy of that ship is to loot and steal, then it's a pirate ship doesn't matter who the captain is. And the ANC's policy remains to loot explicitly and implicitly. So the oh. question is not, are the, is the court going to stand up to an individual? The question is, will the court be independent enough to stand up against the pirate ship, against the rules of piracy, against the, the social engineering, expropriating without compensating, nationalizing everything, running everything into the ground, national democratic revolution? And in my opinion, well, I have my opinion about who the best justice would be. And and Maya, I think, is interesting. I think she has showed some independence. Um, I was particularly keen on Zondo myself um, oh. because of the part one of his report, page 796, which I keep touting. People should go read it, his systemic analysis of state capture coming down to the rules of the ship rather than any personality. And I think he's got a good analysis there. And that made me keen for him. Uh, but I think that that also makes him the least likely candidate to be put in that position. Nevertheless, he remains on court and there will be other people to be put on the court and let's see how it goes. And I, and good luck to any of them because that court sits between a rock and a hard place. It sits between a government that seems determined to ignore the best interests of its people and the preferences of most South Africans, which is for cutting red tape, getting rid of race-based quotas, uh, getting rid of command councils, getting us all a chance to get on our feet and do a bit of work that's honest and decent. And uh, uh, on that side is the people. And on the other side, I see a bunch of elites who who, who really are just trying to fatten their nests um, mm. and cut everyone else's face. So the court's, uh, the court's in a tricky position. We put too much pressure on the courts. Mm. You know, Tens, as I throw it to you, really, just to wrap up the segment as we move, we have to move on. We're in the final 30, uh, 15, pardon me, minutes of the show. Welcome to it. This is Liberty and Friends. Uh, Tens, you know, th there is something very condescending, perhaps. You know, we, we, we're seeing it play out in America right now with Joe Biden, who's basically outwardly said, almost ANC-esque in nature, I'm only choosing, or I'm looking to choose uh, the next in their case, a, a, a justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, and he's saying, you know, it must be a black woman. So the, the, the traits that is most important in him, or for him rather, is not the person's competency, ability to do the job, albeit that's all implied, I suppose. But effectively what they're arguing is, no, no, their identity is more important uh, the aesthetics, if you will, than anything else. We had that, that same notion play itself out by a one Julius Malema and uh, Dalim Bofu in their questions to uh, ju Judge Mandisa Maya, who's eventually been recommended. Again, not taking anything away from Judge Maya. She's absolutely, yeah, she's absolutely she... brilliant. Uh, sorry, I just, that was a little pause. There's a a bit of ruction outside my window. Um, but it, it is very condescending, isn't it? This, the identity politics playing itself out in what should be institutions of state that serve everybody, regardless of identity. Yeah, that's the problem with all quotas, I guess, is as soon as you bring identity politics into it, even if the best candidate wins, I mean, it's, I don't know Justice Maya. I don't know if she's the best, but even if she is, if she gets appointed, We'll never know it. she was appointed because of her um, race or in terms of window dressing. And I think that obsession with the left of just having things in place superficially stems from Soviet-style bureaucracy, where what's filled out of the form doesn't really matter. As long as you have that form filed, then everyone's happy. And, mm. I mean, we can't um, build a proper nation, a proper world 
on um, a system like that where, um, yeah, the American example as well with Joe Biden himself, uh, much of the systemic racism that people are fighting was literally introduced and brought to um, the, um, the Senate by him. And um, not turning it around because it's not fashionable to um, be a Democrat like that anymore. Now is the Democrat they want in order to be president. But awesome. yeah, we're seeing all of that. And just to get back to local issues, how ridiculous is it that you have someone with many multiple hanging cases over his head um, appointing judges? Like, how yeah. can Malema be on that? Um, it's delicious irony, if anything. But guys, I must move us on. Final issue of the evening, uh, because the comment section is going to kill me if I don't actually bring this up. Joe Rogan. Oh my goodness, has he not had a bumper uh, roller coaster of a week? And it really is continuing into this week. I'll quickly just set it out. Joe Rogan, host of one of, if pardon me, host of the largest podcast in the world at the moment average viewership per episode of 11 million the, the closest other thing that is watched in terms of viewership is the tucker carlson show at about three million uh, so that tells you really of how much he's in a league of his own insofar as viewership that chap who's been running a podcast giving platform to other voices, especially over the last two years of the spicy cough. He's been giving voices to other individuals who have not only challenged the narrative, but also just in some cases completely eviscerated the narrative. That chap is now coming under assault from various quarters, primarily the corporate media. Morris, I'll begin with you, um, who are trying to effectively get him deplatformed, or as the left would put it, cancelled their expression that they often used um and they've done the, the the cheeky thing marius and this is what i want you to chime in having failed to prove that he's peddling quote-unquote misinformation and false uh, 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 facts and the like they've now pivoted to a convenient uh, 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 ruse uh, of the the, the the leftist scoundrel uses and this is to appropriate race and specifically black people to go after people because of blacks, of course, being a victim class in their, in their world, accusing Joe Rogan specifically of being racist. There was a video that flighted, I was going to play it here, but I wasn't sure if it would know, demonetize this episode, of a compilation of him using uh, the word nigger or N-word in particular, as Americans put it. Um, of course, not attributing any context, but basically saying he, because he used that word, He's a racist. Yeah, it's it's such a weasel way of doing it. From what I can tell, uh, Joe Rogan never used it as a uh, as a slur. He never addressed it to somebody to insult yeah. them, or whatever. He was just you know using it in certain contexts. Same as exact same way Adam Abib did it at SOAS last year or the year before. We said yep. the N word, and people tore him apart. Whatever you think about Adam Abib, it was also disgraceful what happened to Adam Abib in my opinion. But it's. Uh, it's also this way, this whole thing that there's got to be misinformation about, you know, COVID and so on. For myself, I've I've looked at a lot of things. I've I've, I've been vaccinated. I think vaccines are a pretty good idea. It should be everybody's uh, own own decision to take the vaccine, though. But everybody needs to. You should be able to be free to go find any information you want on the vaccine and make your own decision. And your and at the end of the day, you can only be thought of as having a, a what's a, an informed opinion if you've looked at all the information you wanted to look at. And there'll be a lot of people who, same as me, have looked at things where we've been told, you know, the vaccine is a bad idea, but read other things where I've come to, uh, you know, this conclusion by myself that the vaccine is a good idea. As I say, I've taken it. It should be everybody else's own decision to do so. But it's actually, this, this, this grace has been happening to Joe Rogan. And I've, said, I've never actually listened to one of his podcasts, but this weekend I actually did. First time ever because of what's been happening. And I mean, the guy is just, he's such an interesting uh, interviewer. Actually, he's got such an easy way of, with guests. And I just watched two podcasts or clips of podcasts this weekend. One was with uh, an astrophysicist who was talking about that uh, Wuma, Wuma, I think it's called, was the first extrasolar object to ever come into our solar system. It was fascinating. Another guy who spoke to an, another astrophysicist about what happened before the Big Bang, you know, and all this, you know, the nature of time and all this kind of stuff. And he speaks to such fascinating people. And I think, you know, we, we need to let people make their own decisions about these things and you know each spot five they want they can go put a thing at be, before each uh show saying you know the uh, information this uh following show is um 
when we're for a dispute or whatever, which is fine. But at the same time, if Joe Rogan got, say, Anthony Fauci on, and he said, you know, everyone's get vaccine, it's the best thing ever. Will every single person who's listening to Joe Rogan suddenly rush out to the nearest place and get the J&J and the Pfizer? No, of course not. People who will have done their own research and whatever, they'll decide, well, the vaccine's free. I want to go do it. Same as Joe Rogan has not made... <laughs> anybody who's died from COVID because they didn't get vaccinated is not Joe Rogan's fault. People have made their own decisions and we have to treat people like adults. And if they want to listen to Joe Rogan or not, or listen to whatever they want to listen to, they should be allowed to... We, You know, and going back... This is not the first time that, uh, you know, uh, the elites or whatever you want to call it, push back. I'm sure when uh, Johan Gutenberg invented the printing press, the various kings in Central Europe would have got upset that now there's, you know, information spreading around which they don't have control over. And I think this is, you know, it's the thing as old as humanity has been since we've been able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, write down information, since we invented writing, basically. And we've, we've probably had this kind of battle in, in our societies. And I think it's exactly what's happening now. And... Joe Rogan, as I said, what's happening to him is an absolute disgrace. You are free to disagree with him. And guess what? If you don't like him, don't listen to him. Absolutely. Maris, that, that, that penultimate point you made is actually quite important. It's the idea that actually for the last two years, Tim, I want to come to you with this one. For the last two years, the spicy cough and the lockdowns have basically allowed a small elite, I call them the establishment, politicians, governments, and the corporate media who shill on their behalf, a small elite, to be the single source of information over the past two years. In fact, I want to bring everybody's memory back to where this thing began two years ago. Do you guys remember that they actually made it illegal? They made it illegal for you to speak on this topic because you could be, quote unquote, passing misinformation on this. They literally uh, risked using you... Um, they literally risked you coming into contact with state violence over the notion of you potentially saying something about this that they don't approve of. And that, for me, is perhaps the reason why they are so vicious in going after Ujo Rogan, a man with a massive platform actually saying, hey, to hell with the notion that only one grouping gets to um, uh, spin a narrative. If anything, on this platform... I, the host, because Joe Rogan does, never inserts himself in his interviews, if you really notice, he allows the guest to speak and the guest to share their views. And Tim, that's perhaps what scares the corporate media and really the establishment, the elites. No, of course it does. And what Joe, what Joe Rogan does and why, why I think he's so popular is that he threatens the narrative in a, in a very, very logical way. He never inserts himself into the conversation, and he gets he gets he, he gets people on that are experts in their field, and he lets them mm -hmm. voice their opinions, and people make up their own minds. Um, so this 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 narrative that's being threatened is now is now what's what's causing people to attack him. Um, luckily, luckily for him, he's got he's got guys like Daniel Van Eck at at Spotify who who have now come out publicly and said that they're not going to cancel him. Um, like the like the lefties are, are trying to do, um, and and he's going to be allowed to to continue with his stuff. Even though I think some some of his podcasts have actually been removed. I think there's been about seventy five of them. But um, yeah, Bo, I think silently removed by the way by Spotify. Bo yeah, so there's going to be there, there's going to be people making offers to Joe, and they're going to they're going to start uh, they're going to start offering him money, and he's going to go oh, okay, well, cool. I don't want to have to deal with this nonsense anymore. I'm going to just move over to someone else. Or I'm going to go into independent, and he, there's nothing stopping him from going independent himself. So, um, yeah, on the whole on the whole issue anyway is, uh, and, and I'll end it with this, is no one cares if you deleted Spotify. Hmm. There's people <laughs> posting on Facebook and Twitter, I'm deleting Spotify. No one gives a damn. The guy's well, getting a good. Uh, the guy's getting good publication. People who've never heard of Joe Rogan before are now googling Joe Rogan, and they're going, "Holy crap! This guy is fantastic, and he's a comedian, and he's hell of a funny." Um, I'm going to listen to his podcast now. So now it's marketing. Uh, it's it's the Streisand effect anyway, uh, and uh, he's just getting more more listeners anyhow. Absolutely. Let me throw it to you, Gabriel. Uh, and guys, we, we must end uh, we, we, after tennis. Tienes, um, You know, we, we're in a situation here, Gabriel, and I really want you to be brief on this one, because we're in a situation now where it, there is a vicious pushback, 
a vicious pushback against those who dare to stand for, whether indirectly or directly, free speech. If you dare stand for free speech, how dare you? We'll come after you. We'll make things up for you, uh, uh, up, up, up about you, pardon me, um, and we'll try and destroy you in the most vicious manner possible because that's literally what they're trying to do with the jaw. I'm disgusted by the fact that they're appropriating uh, black people to do this and really the, the age-old woke uh, uh, areas of identity, whether race or gender, to do this. Um, and Joe has made the, the small mistake of, of chumming the water, as it were, by apologizing uh, to these people when he really shouldn't have. But really, Gabriel, here, the at issue is the free speech, isn't it? Totally, totally. I think that the, 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 the stakes have not been higher in our lifetime. Because we literally since since world war ii in outside of the soviet union and china there has never been such an encroachment or such an increased encroachment on liberty yeah with the exception okay uh in in most of the first world and in south africa since the end of apartheid there's never been such a sudden increase in state power here's the thing first impressions matter Law, final impressions matter. The in-between stuff is always going to be interesting to people like us because it's our jobs to follow yeah. the news and think about it and remember what happened and so on and so forth. But most people are going to remember their first impression and their last impression. And I think that is why the anti-free speech crowd is getting so desperate right now. Yeah, Because they know we're entering the endemic endgame. They know that they can't accept it because they had a lockdown forever mentality. They had a zero COVID mentality. We're not going to get zero COVID. COVID is going to stick around uh, as it was always predicted to do by the best scientists, but as it was always ignored by most media houses. It's just going to get less and less severe, less and less deadly, less and less uh, uh, hectic because more and more people have antivirus. They need towards the end, more than ever before, they need people to believe that government was big mama taking oh. care of us, getting nothing wrong, feeding us the milk of kindness, making us happy and safe and secure, never stealing, never being ignorant, never bullying, never being just terrible, terrible, awful, uh, uh, wicked, wicked witch. Oh. And right now, it's people like Joe Rogan that, that pose the greatest threat to that last impression. This is the person leaving the party and they want to go, they want to say goodbye, like at the coolest moment, uh, but they've got like toilet paper hanging out their pants. <laughs> and, and, and so the little kid who's like, hey, what's that going on over there? Who's pointing it out? They want to smack that kid. So I think it's, I think it's really important right now to respect free speech uh, and, to, and to hear diverse opinions, find the facts. Uh, it's going to set the tone for the next few years. And and I just want to respond to a commentator to finish off. Someone sure. said, I bet in Moonchild, I think it was, said in 10 years, we're going to look back and we're going to be amazed, astonished, disgusted at how we let government take so much power. Maybe, maybe not. You know, Soviet Union, Soviet Union, it happens that you give away some freedom and 10 years later, you've given away so much more freedom Oh. that you look back and you say those were the good old days venezuela when they first gave away property rights for example they thought okay now it's a little bit bad for a year the currency halved gdp went down 10 percent. those were the good old days things only got much 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 worse if we don't stand up and make our voices heard against authoritarianism <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get worse. And I think Absolutely. most people are going to stand up, but they have to. Complacency is not an option. Absolutely. Tense, I'm going to have you close this segment up for us because there's something to be said, and I must quickly bring this in. You know, David, uh, uh, pardon me, not David, what's his name? Um, uh, blah, 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 pardon me. Daniel uh, Eck, who's the CEO of Spotify, didn't really come out unequivocally and say, hey, man, uh, Joe Rogan's our guy, we're defending it. Yes, he basically said, we'll stick with Joe. But he then also, also offered an apology to his employees for Joe Rogan being on that platform. I'm sorry, I'm not that guy. I'm a free, it's either you stand for free speech 
or you don't. You don't come out and do a mealy mouth apology and then say, oh, you know, but we have to keep him because of the bottom line. It's bull. Oh, and it's all. It's bull nonsense. What you really want to see here is more people coming out and saying, no, we stand for free speech. It is a fundamental tenet in any free society. And if we give this fight up now, then really the censors win. The you go against community standards uh, douchebags win. Uh, again, it, it's a central tenet to a free society. No, for sure. Um, yeah, but the problem is, um, like if you recall the, those first three weeks of lockdown, most of us were in favor of that because we didn't really know what was going on. Just like now with much of the long COVID type stuff, very few of us actually really know what's going on. Um, it's a new thing. Best we can do is act on the information we have at our disposal at that very time. But um, Joe Rogan is instrumental in that for bringing to the fore all kinds of information. I mean, he had so many pro-state and pro-vax people on his oh. um, show. I'm not a regular listener, but um, I've seen who he's had on there. He's had a massive blend of many people, and he spoke to each of them for hours on end. And now I'm um, going and nitpicking, oh, you gave those people uh, space on your show and wanting to cancel him for that, and then kind of apologizing, similar to what we saw at um, Dave Chappelle. And in the end, um, Joe's going to remain with Spotify. Dave Chappelle's going to remain on Netflix because they bring in money. And in the end, the market dictates what um, continues and what does not. Oh, God bless the market. Oh, oh, and maybe with that being said, let me say God bless every single one of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Guys, as always, as we do, very briefly, 20 seconds each, uh, how do the folks find you on your social media or your respective podcast and the like? Uh, Tim, let me begin with you. How do the folks find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, T-I-M underscore M-E-H-87 or just uh, do a quick Facebook search for Abstergo Solutions uh, on uh, on Facebook and you'll find me there. Uh, I do ma marketing, uh, speech writing, public relations, all that sort of stuff. So hook me up. Excellent. So that is, of course, Upra Tim Flack. You heard him, how you can reach him. Uh, Morris Putti, how do the folks reach you? Uh, yeah, you can find uh, my writing as well as uh, Gabriel's at uh, dailyfriend.co.za. We're both on a podcast there, Daily Friend Show. That's uh, You can find all the links on the Daily Friend website. We're also on YouTube. Just search for Daily Friend. And if people want to follow me on Twitter, my uh, at is uh, just Marius C. Ritt. So my name, then my initial C and my surname. Excellent. So thank you, Marius. Super appreciate that. Gabriel, how do the folks find you? Talk to me. What are you guys doing at the Two Crickets and a Thorn Tree? Oh, uh, two, two Crickets and a Thorn Tree uh, coming in hot. I, 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 it's, a secret, it's a secret surprise, but go check it out. Nice. It'll be coming out tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> IRR.org.za. Please go to our website. Uh, we've just uh, launched our petition to end the new nationwide race quotas that the Employment Equity Amendment Bill, which has been passed by... Uh, the National Assembly is going through the Council of Provinces. We'll be going to Ramaphosa's desk. It is, it is madness. It's terrible. Read a lot about it, a lot of detail. Stop it. Add your voice to it. We want, let's get, let's get ten thousand pronto. Um, IRR. Let's let's vlog today. on that one tomorrow, if you don't mind. Let's vlog on that Happy one tomorrow. To. Let's do that. Shap shap. Gabriel Cross, the of course. Show. <laughs> there you go. Gabriel Cross, of course from the Daily Friend and, of course, two crickets in a thorn tree and the IRR booty tins. Last but not least, how do the folks find you on social media and uh, at Solid Data Date? Yeah, I'm on um, Twitter. My handle is at Tins the Bison, just my name and surname. Simple as that. And then um, you can also follow Solid Date. I've got a couple of um, Great campaigns coming up, and my favorite one being the deregulation of the petrol price. So, yeah. Fantastic. And thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. That's Tiens Dubousson. 
uh, still butchered it, but I'll get it right eventually. That's Tiens, of course, from Solidarity. Um, and thank you, by the way, for watching tonight's show. You are instrumental. You're a part of the show. So big thanks to you. And thank you guys for getting my likes up. I see they're at that irrequisite 50% engagement tonight. Guys, thank you so much. Remember, you can. And please consider supporting the Big Daddy Liberty Show. Woo! There's so many things we're looking to get in place, guys. And it really is your contributions that are allowing that. Some guys are doing 50 rand a month, others 100 rand a month. It is definitely going towards getting us into some studio space uh, up in Joburg when I finally leave the farm, <laughs> when it's up and running and back in and, and get myself back in Johannesburg. With that being said, I'll see you on Wednesday for uh, uh, the Big Daddy Liberty show. Interesting show coming, so look out for that. And with that being said, good night, guys. I'll see you uh, sometime this week on Wednesday and the like. I'll put you that ending. A reminder, as I always say at the end of every show, never trust a commie. <laughs>